Today is the second to the last discussion session for this quarter. Um, next week will be the last discussion for this quarter, and the course will continue on. I think someone emailed me about the class continuing on next quarter. It runs uh, fall, winter, spring, and half time during the summer for, uh, for coverage for outreach events. Um, but next week there will be lunch, so we want to compete with anyone, and you guys don't have to pack lunch, so that'll be exciting. Um, so a few things, we have a really quick guest speaker and then uh, the, the speaker who will lead the discussion today. But uh, two quick things, uh, the new website URL is healthandhomelessness.com. It cost me 50 cents, so I figured uh -huh. I get it, it just redirects to the Catalyst site. So that's an easy way to remember, if you're thinking about the class, you'll probably know the URL. Um, you can find the schedule, the recordings, the slide sets, the makeup exercises. You can log your outreach, you can find all the outreach opportunities. So everything is on there. If you have any questions, you can go there or email me. Uh, so our first of uh, uh, two guests, uh, we'll talk about Project Chance. Uh, Steve is from the School of Pharmacy, and we'll talk about an outreach opportunity everyone can participate in. This. So I am Steve. I am a fourth year pharmacy student. So I'll start off just with a show of hands. How many of you know what Project Chance is, or have heard of it? Okay, so you've heard of it a little bit. Does anybody want to say what they know about it? A little bit? That's my role, there's a check and see what's happening in the room. So Project Chance is something that I started my first year of pharmacy school. And so the name is based off of the grant that led to its creation. So during my first year, I was volunteering at a, a pharmacy that's part of the Pioneer Square Clinic, which is part of the Harborview system. And so there, it's a 340B pharmacy, and I got this email that came out. Actually, it was through the IHI email list, and it said, you know, there's this grant opportunity for anybody who wants to apply for it. It's a $10,000 grant, and it's from APHA, which is the American Pharmacists Association. So it's really good to know that there are a couple of different PHAs. There's the American Public Health Association, and there's the American Pharmacists Association. And so the grant was through them, and then through HRSA, which is through the Health Resources and Services Administration. So what we did was we put together a proposal and ended up getting the grant, and that led to the development of this project. So it's based mostly around the downtown Seattle area and mostly around Harborview. And so the whole goal from the beginning was to set up classes, essentially, or sessions where we could speak with patients, and generally they're patients who are low income or who don't have homes. And currently, all of the classes that we do are based at what's called the respite program, which is part of Harborview. So how many people have heard of the respite program? Are all familiar? Okay, so a couple of people here. So respite is basically an area where patients can go where they're not sick enough to stay in the hospital, but they generally don't have somewhere very safe and secure to go home to. And so respite is sort of an intermediate place that they can go to. So oftentimes it's patients who have some type of foot infection, they need intravenous antibiotics, and they need somewhere that's safe and secure. And so, respite for Harborview is in a big building, so a big tall tower that's essentially right next door to Harborview. And so there's one floor there, and so it's staffed with nurses and with other medical personnel. And so it's a place where patients can stay for weeks at a time, and they have a really nice meeting room, which is really, really great. And so the classes are based in that meeting room, and so they're, group sessions where basically you know patients can choose to come in voluntarily and we talk about a variety of different topics so most of it is based around diabetes just because diabetes has a higher prevalence and it's more difficult to control in patients who are homeless or have very low incomes so that's a lot of what we talk about and so we have brochures that we use and they're nice and colorful and everybody gets a copy of that and then we lead these sessions, and what's really nice about the sessions is that they're very interactive. So we don't want them to be just something where we have people, you know, students go up and give like this cookie cutter type presentation where it's this information, 
and it's static and boring, we want the patients to really participate, and that way they get a little bit more engaged. Another thing that's really nice about it is that, you know, one of the things I really wanted to do for these patients is, because a lot of them feel like they're not heard a lot of the time, a lot of them feel like, um, you know, people don't always listen to the concerns that they have. So, in the beginning, we have very open, you know, conversational type topics where they can talk about their experiences, and oftentimes the different patients who are in the room can learn from each other, which is really great because we have, you know, some patients who have diabetes who have had it for many years, for example, some patients who are very new to it, and they'll talk about what they've gone through. Then another thing that we do is we, you know, very much cater the information to the population. So rather than providing the standard recommendations that a lot of us are used to, that we're taught in our classes for you know general population, we focus on the information that's relevant to them. And so things that can actually help them. And so some of the issues that they see is you know inconsistent access to food. It's not always that they don't have access to food. Part of the issue is that it you know is not always on a regular schedule. And then the food that they do have access to. A lot of times it's very carbohydrate rich, and so it can be challenging for them to pick the best food choices. And so we talk about topics around that. And then we also lead sessions on smoking cessation, which was a request from the patients who were there. And at the end of the, all, the, all the sessions, we get feedback from all the patients on uh, you know, what was most helpful for them, what they would like to see in the future, and all of that. And so currently, most of the sessions are led by pharmacy students. So it was a, a pharmacy started project, but it's very much an interdisciplinary one. So students from all the different health professions are welcome to come and help teach the sessions, help contribute to new sessions, and it's a really, really neat experience. And it's beneficial for the patients in part because it gives them more engaged in their care. A lot of them learn a lot of really interesting things that they've never heard before. And then it's really beneficial for all the students who participate too, just because you get to better understand that population. And because it's so conversational, you really get to learn a lot about their experiences. And so I have a sign-up sheet here, so I'll pass that around. We'll just have it go around the room like that. So you can sign up on this list, and then we'll contact you with a little bit more information. You're welcome <coughs> to participate if you want. The sessions have been twice a week. So basically, we do you know one topic per week. One topic is eating well when you don't have consistent access to food and or have diabetes or at risk of it. And then other topics are understanding your medicine <laughs> and we make them fairly broad. A lot of it has a diabetes theme, but we talk about anything that's useful for patients. And we can eventually, I know that there are a good number of dental students in here, and so oral health would be a great topic. And we did actually have dental student participation in the past, and we do have some slides that are prepared that we could use to create a brochure. And so if dental students are interested in coming and participating, that would be awesome. So I'll pass this around, and I'm totally open to questions. Any so if there's no questions, I'll I would encourage all of you, if you have the chance, to create a new type of project. And you can really have a big impact and it's very valuable and important. So I'll conclude with that and I'll pass this around and I'll hand it back to David. Thank you. Uh, the session's recorded, but I think you might have taken a, a Google Glass video recording of the audience right then. No, I didn't. I, yeah, so I, I wear a Google Glass, but I wouldn't record anything. No, just, yeah. <laughs> um, so I think the sign-in sheets are now available. Yeah? Okay. And, and she was passing, always passing out all the evaluations. Um, so without further ado, I'll introduce uh, Lainey. Lainey is the board president of REACH. Uh, uh, REACH Center of Hope is a day center and night shelter for homeless women and children, including boys over the age of 12. The Center of Hope partners with a number of agencies to ensure that our, health, our clients are accessing every avenue possible as they make their journey from homelessness to the world. And that's just one of the projects that I believe REACH participates in, or that REACH has. So she's the president of the overarching organization. So let's welcome Lainey.
Um, so just a little bit about me. Um, uh, I am, uh, by profession, I'm a manager consultant, and um, probably 95% of the projects that I work, worked on in my career were healthcare projects. So I worked, in fact, I worked here, so I get to work here on the, um, I, maybe I shouldn't say this, but I'm uh, Cerner um, EMR implementation that happened last May. So if you're a med student or resident type person, you might know a little bit about that. Um, but so I've worked um, since the mid 90s on healthcare initiatives, uh, healthcare improvement initiatives, um, uh, mostly in operations. And I really wanted to make a difference. I was really, really passionate. In fact, I went to school here and got my graduate degree here at UW, um, focusing on health policy. Um, and I just became a lot more frustrated with sort of working in the business of healthcare and wanted to just get my hands dirty in sort of the grassroots. And um, I met this wonderful woman at my church um, who got me interested in um, this organization called REACH, which is the Ren Ecumenical Association of Church. How many of you know what ecumenism is? Okay, Do you, can you, what's your, what's your take on ecumenism? Well, it's a by Churches of different faiths to come together and reach agreement on things that they can work together on. Right, right, exactly. So um, Maggie Breen is the executive director for, for REACH, and what REACH is, and REACH has been around 40 years. Uh, REACH is a um, nonprofit organization that's been a grassroots organization for 40 years, but only in 2011 did we become an official incorporated nonprofit. Um, and uh, they reached down a lot of great things in the South, South Seattle, Renton area over the past 40 years, among them serving the homeless in terms of food and shelter and uh, raising funds for uh, food banks. This, this, uh, you guys may have heard of Crop Walk, responsible for Crop Walk in Renton. There's other communities around the Puget Sound area that have Crop Walk as well. But that's a little bit about me. I got into this um, in the last couple of years. Uh, by falling passionately in love with REACH and the work that they do in the South King County area. Um, and I basically decided that I'm backing off of my professional career. I'm working less um, paid work, about 10 hours a week, and I do probably close to 30 hours a week of just community service work, which is fortunate for me. I'm lucky to be able to do that. Um, but I'm also getting older. So now's the time for me to do, do uh, things that I feel like are going to be part of my lasting legacy. So. REACH, um, our vision is really about community for the sake of the world, and that's kind of a common denominator in ecumenism, I think, or at least one of them. It's, it's to kind of, what is the one thing that we can come together on that we're not going to really disagree on? People go to church, they have um, philosophies or, or um, guiding principles, values that they go to church, um, and reasons and ways that they like to worship, but at REACH, we kind of believe that we all need one another, um, and that we need to just acknowledge that there is this one kind of common denominator of um, a common dignity that, that humanity um, is of value, inherent value, and that everyone deserves a place on earth and some respect. And so uh, we believe that, that that's kind of one of the common denominators, and so this is our sort of our vision, that, that the world will kind of realize that we all, we all need one. Our mission um, in pursuit of that vision is to really recognize that um, we can be of service to each other in our community by helping, uh, helping each other out in a sustainable way. The great thing about ecumenism is, is we all acknowledge every single church acknowledges that we can do more together than we can do alone. And so uh, in the past, and in fact still in a lot of communities, you know, one church doing you know, soup, Sundays or soup Wednesdays or food drives or building something. Uh, but what you'll find that sooner or later kind of the passion kind of works then, the resources work then, the money works then. And what we figured out in Renton is how to not only partner with churches, but to also partner with the city, other nonprofits, Catholic Community Services, which is separate from the Catholic Church, but and other nonprofits. Um, but increasingly businesses as well to really make um, make sure that people are getting fed on a regular basis, to make sure that people are getting health care on a regular basis, and to make sure that, uh, to do our best, to not burn out the people who provide those services. 
the volunteers and the community members and the people of faith. Uh, the other thing is is that is to really look at advocating for people so that in in the process of doing that work, um, we bring people together um, so that they learn about one another and they realize that you know people aren't so scary after all. They aren't so different from me. That I am rewarded when I do this work, um, and that. That, it, that, that improves me, that improves my, my life, my health, my personal well-being, um, my happiness, and as well as improving the person that I'm with. So I think that in all it's about community and in all it's about sustainability, right? So, uh, oops, did I skip? No, values. So our values, I kind of touched on these already, but um, the big ones I think that, that are relevant to healthcare, I think, are the kind of the dialogue. Um, and one of the things I believe um, the, the gentleman who spoke earlier about Project Chance, he, uh, he talked about patients who feel like they don't get listened to a lot. Um, one of the, one of our huge values in the work that we do is really um, coming in to situations where we're supporting people of you know, limited resource um, with them at the table in terms of solutions for uh, what is going to actually help their situation listening and treating them with dignity and respect, uh, as well as the same sustainability aspect, which I mentioned earlier. Does someone have a question? I thought I saw a hand up. So one thing I will say, as I talk, it's OK to raise your hand and, and interrupt me along the way. I'm, I don't you know, need to wait until the end of the questions. But, um, so, but all of these things, being people of faith, obviously faith is a common value, um, respect and dignity, and so forth. Um, communi communion. Um, probably you can guess this, but the root of that is about community. And that means sitting down um, at the table together, having meals together, and getting to know one another, building community. Not only with the people that we're serving, but um, the other people with the faith. It's very, very enriching. So the scope of the work that we do, the scope of our services is, we decided we need to come up with an acronym so that it would prompt our board members and our staff uh, to remember um, what is the what is the what are the services that we provide instead of having to remember all the programs they could remember an acronym and that would kind of prompt their memory. So uh, this is probably in the last six months we've come up with this and it's really been helpful. Uh, it's Chef and the idea uh, is shelter, health and well-being, education, employment, and food. <laughs> so here are some homeless statistics uh, about homelessness in Renton. 90, and this is just this past January, you guys know that King County does the count, count of the homelessness on uh, the pick a night, and then everyone, every count, every community in the county has volunteers that go out and help the city and county officials count the uh, homeless um, that are out that night. It was 90 in Renton, but that does not count people who are couch surfing uh, or in a shelter or whatever. Um, 432 is number of families last year in school district who did not place to call home. A lot of those people are doubling up, living with fam family or friends. A lot of people we see and some of the people we've served in the center Pope are people who um, have a place to be at night, but are absolutely not allowed there during the day, so they have to be on the streets. Um, kids can go to school um, and then figure out where to go until they can be, um, be at, be at at the shelter at night, um, and then start the whole thing all over again. Uh, 100 is the average number of people we're, we're seeing at our community supper um, at the Salvation Army, which hosts the community supper uh, seven nights a week in downtown Renton. And then 54% is the percentage of the children that receive reduced or free meals in Renton School District. So the cause of homeless, some of this is probably similar to what you've seen in um, other discussions you've had in this course, uh, that we're seeing is financial emergency. So people having um, challenges, unexpected medical bills, losing their job. Um, domestic violence is a huge one for the center of hope. Um, uh, a lot of what we see are women who are um, sort of secondary and tertiary victims of um, uh, veterans. So their husband or their boyfriend is a returned uh, veteran from Afghanistan or Iraq and not handling it well, and the marriage falls apart, family falls apart. Um, and then 
one of the other things that I've seen, especially around the bills area, is people who do simple things like your car tab. So you get a parking ticket or a um, speeding ticket or some other kind of uh, violation, or you just can't pay your vehicle registration, and that compounds, the fees compound, you lose your car, then you lose your job, then it's a, it's a vicious cycle, and if you can't maintain a job, you certainly can't save up to get your car out of impound, and it's horrible for the owner of living wage, um, they're just kind of get stuck. So that's kind of what we're seeing. Uh, these are obstacles to getting out of that cycle. Um, probably these don't look um, that unfamiliar to you with either. Um, one of the things that we're also seeing quite a bit is um, not, especially in Renton, it's probably a little bit, there's more availability of showers and things like that in Seattle than there is in Renton. We have a real, real challenge with people being able to get, get bathed. I know one gentleman who has to drive up to Seattle to get showers because the the place that provides showers in Renton, they'll provide you a shower, but they won't give you a towel. So, you know, you have one set of clothes and it's 20 degrees outside like it's been for the last two weeks. Are you likely to take that shower? And then if you can't take the shower, then are you likely to be able to be presentable and go in and even get your benefits checked? So that's the kind of thing that compromises the human dignity. Um, and then, of course, illness. Uh, another really compelling story, a gentleman who's I met a couple of times at some of the meals. Uh, recently, he, he'd been to the ER several times in various hospitals in South King County and um, <laughs> suffered from some pretty bad pain and complained about pain quite a lot. And I don't recall him saying anything about pain to me, but definitely finally was diagnosed with um, end-stage lung disease at uh, Valley just a month ago or so. And it's, it's really sad because if some of the physicians who'd seen him earlier had in the ER granted some challenges, some challenging situations, but I mean, he, he admitted that he, he feels like they thought, they admitted to him that he, they thought he was drug seeking. And so they didn't really listen to some of his uh, frustrations about the pain that he was in. So, and that poor gentleman um, didn't really have a place to go afterwards and we're working on getting him some, some housing for his last two or three months. That he has a life. Tough situation for people. Okay. So, so, this is a little bit about um, uh, the services, the programs that we have in each of the areas of our scope. Uh, I think that we've got a really unique model here because, once again, it's not about trying to recreate the wheel. Um, it's about partnering with organizations who already do things really well. Um, organizations like Catholic Community Services. Um, uh, the woman who founded the Center of Hope is the same woman who founded Mary's Place. I was talking to David a little bit earlier about Mary's Place. Some of you may be familiar with that. You may be planning to visit Mary's Place. Uh, she's helped us found the Center of Hope in partnership with the City of Renton. That's actually a women's and children's uh, shelter that's, that's actually housed in a former jail in downtown Renton. So when you go into City Hall in Renton, uh, the basement, um, one side of it's a jail, the other side of it's a former jail that we've converted to the center of hope. It's pretty amazing, it's actually a really beautiful place. It's colorful, there are kids there, they're playing, they're watching TV, they're doing their homework, they're women looking for jobs, ironing their clothes, get, gathering things to um, go on job interviews, <laughs> meeting with their social worker, their caseworker, and a couple times a week, and just, it's really cool stuff. Um, we brought a lot of women through that program, and about half of them into permanent housing or transitional housing, and others of them have gone on to live with families, so it's a real success story. The only downside of that is every once in a while we'll have a family who's truly intact, married father and mother with two or three kids, and the dad just can't stay because you have other women who are in a situation where they're not, they're not feeling safe around the men. So I think the trend is to look at shelters that we're, we're, we may be able to house intact families, um, and we can keep them separate from families where there's domestic violence, the history, and the women aren't feeling safe around men. But for now, the Center of Hope serves women with children under 18. Um, Arise is one of the programs that's been around for eight or nine years um, since we were a grassroots organization before we were even a formal nonprofit. Arise is for homeless men, and they rotate through the churches of Renton um, once a month. So one month they'll be at our church, and we feed them for two weeks and another church who can't house them 
feeds them for the other two weeks, and then they rotate to another church. And they can sleep in the church, and they have a, they have a meal or snack there. They eat at the community supper like everyone else, um, but they get a meal seven nights a week. They get breakfast, they get a sack lunch, and they get a caseworker who can help them find jobs or education. It's a really cool program as well. And that's another way that we're able to shelter people, and none of us are taking on a huge burden because we're sharing it as a community, right? Um, the Rent and Sanctuary Movement. Um, oh, sure. Can I ask you about both of those? Civil yeah. Civil and Rise. Mm -hmm. Are you bumping up against not having enough room, having turn people away because the demand is greater than your resource for shelter in both of those programs? Yeah. So for for Arise, Arise has different requirements than than uh, the Center of Hope. Arise, I don't consider an emergency shelter. Arise is a program for men who are written work ready. So they're not the chronically homeless, so some of them are, but mostly they're men who kind of down their luck, they kind of lost their job, and before they get too far gone, you want to get them into a rise and they get them back in house. That's kind of, a rise is, has a, it's run by Catholic Community Services. Like I said, it was before REACH Incorporated, so we didn't have executive director, you know, insurance, staff, and so forth, so the grassroots organization formed it, and then Catholic Community Services agreed to manage it. So they have put in place um, some guidelines to, 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 and in partnership with the city of Renton, to figure out how they could get success. And so they screen it for the people they feel like they can be successful with. So that's a little different. The Center of Hope is more about, we're gonna get these people into transitional housing, or we're gonna stay with them until they get some other kind of housing, like with family. And, and so that's truly emergency housing. And if we find that, one of the reasons why that program's in place is because the mayor of Renton, Linda caught him in a weak moment. The mayor of Renton said, I gotta protect my, my cops. My cops are finding women with kids on the street or sleeping in a car. And, and I, I need to tell them, I need to have something, somewhere to send them. Because you know, in Seattle, there's somewhere to send them. In Renton, there wasn't anywhere to send them. And you know, there were people who were scrambling, trying to find a hotel, I mean, it was kind of a mess. So, that's the kind of scenario that started to win him over. And now the mayor of Bellevue is calling the mayor of Renton saying, hey, what are you doing down there? I heard good things about Center of Hope. How can we tap into that? So that's a situation where we haven't, there haven't been too many women we've had to really turn away uh, because it's, the nice thing about it is we're, we're able to, at minimum, help women during the daytime. And if they, um, if they can get resources like a computer to call for a job. We help them look for housing if they can find a place to sleep, somewhere else to sleep. If they have kids, what we've had um, is some of the churches say, okay, we can take, we can expand to one more room, or one more children's classroom, or we've got a big closet someone can sleep in. We really try to not turn people away who are on the street with kids from that program. But rent small, I mean, we're renting, so. Did someone else have a question? Did I see other hands up? Um, the sanctuary movement is um, kind of a two-pronged program. It's kind of morphing right now into day resources, um, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But the sanctuary movement is about the right to have a place to be. Uh, 75 years ago, even 50 years ago, if you were a guy with a backpack and um, you know some hiking boots, you could go to the outskirts of the city and camp and no one would mess with you, no one would bug you. You had a right to be somewhere without getting kind of scooted off in your way. And that's more and more not the case. There's just not anywhere you can be without getting hassled. Um, you can't park your car anywhere without getting ticketed or towed. You can't, um, you can't, it's even if you're like sleepy, you need, you need to sleep, take a, break, take a break before driving somewhere else. It's not okay to park somewhere else in some communities. And Renton was one of the cities where it just wasn't okay to park your car anywhere and be um, without getting hassled. And so uh, what we're looking at with Sanctuary Movement is um, talking to churches or business owners about a, place for, a safe place for people to park their car if they have to live in their car because they have nowhere else to go. And um, not racking up tickets um, because you're already broke. Um, and I'm just feeling like you can relax and not be hassled. Um, or forced to move or towed um, if you have to sleep in your car. And there are several um, 
gentlemen that I know of in, in Renton who have a camper, a truck, or a car that they're living in, and that they have lived in for up to, I know one guy, four years, he's lived in his car. And he was in Fred Meyer parking lot for a year, and Walmart parking lot for a couple years, um, and then more and more people came, and then they, they shoot them away. Um, and so we're trying to work with churches and, and businesses to find that appropriate level of one or two cars so that it doesn't, doesn't attract too many people and permitting those cars and letting them stay there so that, that it's okay. Um, and if more people want to come somewhere, then we can find a different place for them so that it's okay. And what I think we'll find is that the community is going to be okay with that. We're, we've got some churches that are already doing that. Um, but we're looking to find more and more locations where that's okay because you know you just have to have or you, you have to be where the resources are right you have to be where you can get groceries you have to be where you can um, get your pick up your unemployment check or your um, general assistance check and you've got to be where you can get your regular meals so um, health we are developing health ministry right now partnership with Valley Cities which is a mental health resource in South King County um, and we're also looking at, um, in, in conjunction with our day resources, uh, a place to store lockers um, where people can store fresh fruits and vegetables. They can eat something that's better for them um, and prepare something that's better for them. We're, we actually, just the, this last week, started talking about a temporary day place where people can go and sit and be safe during the day. Right now, people are using the public library in Renton, but those are, um, um, going through phases of remodels. The public library in Fairwood is down for a year. It's under remodel. It'll be out of commission. And they're moving it onto the downtown Renton library next, and that'll be closed for a year. And we're very, very concerned that um, during the daytime, especially like next winter, if that library's closed, people won't have a place to go. We have a severe weather shelter, all the cities do, during um, when the weather's lower than 32 degrees. But during the daytime, there's nowhere for them to go except the, the public libraries, and they, uh, that's not going to be, it's, not, it's going to be pretty ugly if we have to put people out on the street during the daytime after the library closes. So we're hoping to open our day shelter in the next couple of months um, where people can sit down and just kind of be without being shooed away um, with some lockers, some showers, um, some cubbies for food, which is separate from lockers. Cubbies for food would be refrigerated and things like that. Talked about Center of Hope, and uh, the Meal Coalition is what puts on the meals seven nights a week um, in Renton. Five nights a week, it's Salvation Army, and then we have one church that does Saturday nights. It's a church called Harambe. Um, that's Soma, church, Soma Community Church, which is a great church. Um, very, very focused and mission-oriented around serving those who are um, under-resourced. And then the uh, REACH puts on the Grace, Grace Feast, which is Sunday night supper. Any questions about our scope of work? It's about 2030, 20, 20, 20, 30 ch churches that are kind of doing all of this work, and most of our volunteers are sourced from those churches. It's really cool. Okay. Um, this is a little detail about all those programs that I mentioned. Companionship, I didn't mention companionship. That's the sort of I'll, um, our leads for the programs are um, pastors. So the executive director, Maggie Breen, is um, a Seattle uh, Theological Seminary. Is that what it's called? Or she's a graduate um, last May from there, and she, she'll be um, she's going through finalizing all of her exams, but she'll be ordained in the next year. Um, all of our other program leads are reverends, uh, Linda Smith's a reverend, um, and Lee and uh, Mel are pastoral interns. So they're in uh, theology school. So, But the idea is that there's a certain kind of gift that you need to kind of uh, mentor all of those volunteers, mentor those staff, um, and work with interfaith people. So we've got, you know, we've got uh, Lutherans and Presbyterians and um, evangelical Christians, and we've got Latter-day Saints, and um, we've got a couple, some of our Seattle contacts and partners are um, Jewish and Muslim. Um, they haven't been active down in Renton yet, but 
the idea is that people with extremely different uh, worldviews are coming together to do this work, and we aren't always seeing 100% eye to eye on how to go about doing it. We agree on what to do um, on our end goal, but the getting there is kind of challenging. So the blessing of having all these pastoral leaders in those roles is that um, that we know that there's that there's uh, there is a way. Somehow there is a way because the goal is the same, and we need to just have some respect for our peers in this um, endeavor because it's not about us, right? So it's about the tough goal. So that's what I really I find very interesting work for me to be involved in, and I do gain a whole lot of respect for other faiths and other ways of doing things. I'm learning a ton, and I do feel very, very, um, very, very, I don't know, humbled by this work, I guess, is one way to put it. Oops, I think I lost something there. Okay, I think, I think that was it. Okay, so these are our partners, just so you can see some of the some of the organizations that we're partnering with. CCS stands for Catholic Community Services, Communities and Schools in Renton. That's how we get most of our referrals. So when we um, get a call that someone needs, a woman and ch some children need, a, need housing, um, most of the time it's from Communities and Schools in Renton. It's because some social worker at a school said, I've got this family here and they're being evicted and they will have nowhere to sleep tonight. 90% of the time comes from someone at one of the schools. Um, yeah. Any questions? So is a uh, under health? Uh huh. Um, the Rotocare van? Yeah. Is that yeah. the principal van? Actually, that's no. The Rotocare van is actually it's um, primary care. So the one of the physicians at Valley, and I'm spacing on his name, um, but he won Citizen of the Year award a couple years back in Renton. Um, helped uh, Renton Rotary found this medical van. They raised. I want to say two or three hundred thousand dollars bought a van that is down in I think it's in the Salvation Army parking lot every Saturday and people with low income and homeless that's where they get the primary care and um, it's a really cool thing because um, the capacity is pretty limited but what's nice is the physicians that volunteer there can refer patients to their practices at Valley Medical and some of the clinics in um, Tukwila, South King County areas. So it's a great thing. It's only been around for maybe three, four years, I think, but it's phenomenal. And I think they are adding some dental services. If they haven't started already, they are very soon. Yeah. Thank you for bringing up the road here, man. Definitely, that's a huge part of work. And the idea um, of all these partnerships is that Something like we know the meals are happening at the Salvation Army every five days a week, right? And if you have some communication you want to get out to the community, that's the place to do it. So that was a logical site for the road care van.